Ian, it's uh, it's publication day. Congratulations to you. You are not necessarily new at this, so uh, you know, four time New York Times bestseller. But do you do anything to celebrate on on publication day as your book drops? Yeah, I take a nap. <laughs> no, <laughs> I uh, no, I don't because. And thanks for having me, Judson. I really appreciate it. It just it's uh, it's still uh, running through the tape. I've always believed in keeping your head down and grinding and. The New York Times bestselling cutoff is this coming weekend. So you want to do everything you can, obviously, to, to sell the book up until that point and even after that point. But when you put the amount of work that uh, authors put into books when it comes out, it's a good feeling to have it in your hands. It really is. And to know people now, instead of pre-ordering it, can go to a store and buy it if they want to. I know that's an old fashioned thing. But yeah, that that feeling of that final product in your hands is hard to beat. Well, let's talk about him. Remarkably talented, probably, you know, equally complicated. Uh, is there one thing about Aaron Rodgers where you said to yourself, OK, I'm, I'm going to put down this. It sounds like this LeBron James book that I'm working on or working towards. And this is why I need to do the deepest of dives into Aaron Rodgers. Well, uh, for starters, I was always fascinated by the Packers. Uh, Vince Lombardi coached at my high school in New Jersey and coached basketball and football. He also lived eight houses away from the house I grew up in. So I, I had a deep feeling for Lombardi in that era of, of great Packers football, the dynasty. And so I always wanted to write a book that was connected to the Packers. And But Aaron, as a figure from afar, one, I always thought he was like the best interview in the NFL. Even if you disagreed with a lot of what he was saying, he's thoughtful, he's candid, he doesn't speak in cl cliches. He speaks in long form responses. And so that interested me also the fact that he at one point was considered one of the good guys in the NFL and then became a villain with four words about COVID in August of 2021. And yeah, I, I just found him to be distant and mysterious. And I'm attracted to figures like that. Derek Jeter was that way, even though I covered him a lot as a columnist in New York, he kept the distance there was a mystery about him. Same with Belichick, of course, and a little bit less so with with Coach K. But those are usually usually the subjects that I'm drawn to. And Aaron was no different. There's an incredible irony. I, I, I guess I would use the word irony really in the first few pages, because you open with talking about Ed Rogers, Aaron Rogers, grandfather, who is a war hero. But you also mention he was born in Chicago. And then he was raised in Decatur, Illinois. As Chicago Bears fans will know, the Decatur Staley's is where it all That's began. Right. <laughs> so his grandfather there in Decatur would then, decades later, watch a grandson perhaps become one of the biggest thorns ever in the side of the Chicago Bears. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I pointed that out in the book, too, so I'm glad you did. And, uh, yeah, his grandfather, that was um, – I wanted to, because of the family estrangement, which has gone on now for nearly 10 years, unfortunately, but I wanted to try to open the book with a positive story about the family and his grandfather. That story had never been told. I was lucky enough to run into a military records expert in Minneapolis named Dan Matthews, who was incredible in researching for me the every mission that uh, Edward Rogers flew, for, 44 of them against the Hitler war machine, and in his B-24 and at times, one time, St. Patrick's Day in 1944, he's on fire and bullet ridden his plane over Nazi Germany and the rest of his squadron peeled off to go on to the next stage of, of their mission. And Rogers said he felt like the loneliest man in the world. And he somehow got that plane on fire back to Italy in the American base there and saved 11 lives, including his own. When he was shot down on the 44th mission, when, when he was hit, he thought the plane might explode. And according to a crew member on the plane, he steered his B-24 away from other American B-24s in case his blew up. He didn't want to kill somebody on another plane. So that is the very definition of an American hero. And he was beaten when he was captured. He was mistreated as a POW. He gave accounts of that mistreatment to war crimes investigators. I found the war crimes report. And when I met with Aaron in Malibu, I said to him, listen, from, from a human standpoint, not a journalist speaking here, I don't think you should read about uh, these details that your grandfather didn't share with you or your family about the way he was mistreated. 
So I'm going to print out a copy of the war crimes interview and send it to you. I want you to have it before the book comes out. So I think he appreciated that and maybe built a little bit of goodwill between us. How surprised were you that Aaron Rodgers was was willing to speak? And in fact, sure enough, he had you over to his home, a rather nice home, by the way. Yeah, (laughs) the nicest backyard interview I've ever been a part of. His backyard is the Pacific Ocean. So we sat on his uh, deck on a bluff above the ocean. It was and it was a beautiful day in February. Uh, Actually, I had handed in the manuscript. I want to say it was late January, early February. Judson and and I assumed I was publishing this biography without any cooperation from Aaron. I had tried multiple times through the Jets, his agent. I went directly to Aaron. I sent him past books I had written to hey, take a look at my work. I'm deadly serious about doing this the right way. And so I think I I wore him down ultimately. I contacted so many of his friends and associates. They were texting him for permission that I think he surrendered in the end. And so I show up and again, beautiful setting. We sat there for, I didn't know how much time he was going to give me because I had told the Jets, listen, I'll fly across the country for 45 minutes with him. So I didn't know if it was going to be a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour and a half. So I needed 15 hours with him and I wasn't getting that. So I had to prioritize what to ask him, what was most important. So I had to throw some subjects overboard and I was concerned if he didn't like the line of questioning 25 minutes in, he might boot me out of there. That didn't happen. So it, it was a two hour fact checking exercise. And he wanted to know, what did my parents say to you? What did you hear about me from the 250 people you interviewed? And so it was a, uh, it was very, it was a healthy sparring session, a, a healthy give and take. It got tense a couple of times. But overall, I, he definitely made it a better book, and he didn't owe me a damn thing. So I appreciate the fact that he gave me those two hours. What was the tense aspect of it? Was it, was it family-related issues? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when we got to the family situation, yeah, it, and I told him, listen, there's not going to be much opinion in this book. But when I write about the estrangement, I'm going to criticize your brothers for one or two things they did. And I'm going to criticize you for one thing you did, which was... His uh, good college buddy and roommate and teammate was getting married. Aaron was in the wedding party. And now different sources told me different things. It was either two days before the wedding, a day before the wedding, or the morning of the wedding. He informed uh, that person, Francis Blay Mieza, that he would not be in his wedding party. In fact, he was not attending the wedding because he had also invited his family. Hmm. And I said, Aaron, that's... That's his call. That's his day. It's his wedding. You don't make the rules that day. And he's your friend and you're in his wedding party. You can't do that. So I'm going to criticize. You needed to rise above your issues with your family for one day. You could have sat on the other side of the room. I'm sure he would have accommodated. Actually, you would have been with him, I assume, at the at the main table. But whatever. You needed to rise above your issues that day and do that for your friend. And he said, well, I respect your opinion. Your opinion is wrong. You're uneducated to the complexity of the situation. And that's that. So my wife got a kick out of that response that I was uneducated to that situation because she has said that to me many times over our <laughs> decades together. <laughs> so, it, but it was a, I, I really do appreciate the fact that uh, he engaged on subjects even like that on the record and uh, did make it a better product. Did you go to a Jets game with his parents? Yeah, the uh, the only game he appeared in, right? 9-11 right. last September, that Brief anniversary. And that was an interesting experience. I drove them to the game. They were wearing Jets gear. They needed a ride, so I offered and, and they accepted. And just I was thinking on the drive in, If and I'm a dad. I only have one son. He's 28 now. But if I, I can't fathom my son not talking to me for 10 years. And so it was a weird experience. I'll, I'll say that they were very nice people. I, I, I think I got along with them and we did have a conversation in the car before and it was pouring rain for a while. So we had to wait out the storm. But his mother, I remember saying that uh, we were talking about how nervous they get before games and really going to a stadium, which they occasionally did in Green Bay at Lambeau Field was the only time they ever got a chance to be in the same room with their son big room, but it's still, they're in the same place with him. And, but she said that they still get nervous before games. And her concern as a mother was, 
he's got a target on him as the quarterback. The whole defense is after him, and she always worries about injury. Well, that night, four snaps in, he's injured and out for the year with a torn Achilles. And I have to say, Judson, it was the most heartsick I've ever felt for a fan base and an athlete because New York had embraced him. New York didn't care about his or put aside his beliefs with conspiracy theories and, and the vaccine and just brought him in like I've never seen a, a superstar embraced from another market. And I've been in New York covering sports for about 37 years. And to have that ripped away after four snaps was really, it just was awful. And so, yeah. And afterward I had to drive his parents home and that was a tough ride. I, I made myself an Uber driver. I just, I didn't speak unless I was spoken to. I let them sit in their silence and suffering to some degree. And it was a somber ride home and a surreal experience. Bears fans finally got rid of the quarterback that they loathe. They get a new quarterback that they have all of their hopes and dreams in. And that quarterback in Caleb Williams can't stop talking about how much he appreciates and idolizes the game of Aaron Rodgers. But <laughs> at 22 years old, with Caleb Williams' skill set, it, it, it shouldn't be a shocker that Aaron Rodgers' style of play is the one that Williams and probably Patrick Mahomes look up to. Absolutely. And it's funny because Tom Brady's the one with seven rings, and you rarely hear these young quarterbacks talk about, I want to be, I want to play like Tom Brady because he wasn't mobile or really athletic. He was a pocket passer, the best ever to do it without question. But I, I did notice that uh, Caleb had said that multiple times and Rogers was his guy, even though he had one ring compared to Brady's seven. And so I think all these young quarterbacks now want that improvisational athletic style of play. And it's really changed the game. And certainly that position by far the most important position in the sport. I think Bears fans are in great shape for the next 15 or so years. And the matchup between him and, and Jordan Love is, is going to be fascinating. At least now the Bears have a quarterback who can match up, if not exceed, the Packers quarterback. It wasn't a fair fight before when Aaron Rodgers was competing against the Bears and tormenting them. But now they have in Caleb Williams a, a guy who is a looks like a first ballot Hall of Famer in terms of talent. And so now it's a fair fight. And maybe the Bears have the edge in the long run. Maybe he's a better player than Jordan Love. We'll see. But I do think it's interesting that if he goes on and wins a couple of Super Bowls for Chicago, he'll do it playing Aaron Rodgers football. Maybe it's fitting. Aaron Rodgers, the, the conspiracy theorist, is not this new thing, right? Uh, this goes back decades even. It goes back to high school. He studied the JFK assassination and came to believe it was a conspiracy involving a government agency and uh, he's not the only American who feels that way. Obviously, a lot of people over the years have come to the conclusion that uh, wasn't just Lee Harvey Oswald, but that is a tame, uh, mild uh, conspiracy compared to some of them he's embraced over the years. And so I, I was talking to a good friend of his who grew up with him and said, when we were young, we embraced magic and miracles. And when you do that, when you believe in magic and miracles, you believe in the possibility of everything, including conspiracies. So uh, explaining it that way, I think is uh, maybe the best explanation I heard for why he started in with conspiracy theories. Another thing that he studied a case was in the 1960s, there was something called Operation Northwoods, which actually happened. It was an evil plot hatched by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to have American uh, military uh, target other American military uh, and, and American civilian targets and stage these attacks blame them on Cuba as justification to start a war with Castro. It was an evil plot. Thankfully, President Kennedy nixed it, but it happened. It was true. And I, I think Aaron, unfortunately, sees an Operation Northwoods behind everything. now, <laughs> And so that's where he is. But conspiracies have been a part of his life for a long time. He's just been a lot more open and public about just talking about it on podcasts and shows. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's not something new. It's just he's just been more open about it. Ian, finally, Aaron Rodgers is a guy that we all have an opinion on, right? Uh, he allows us as such with, with the way he acts and, and with the way he plays. I would probably say I lean more negatively towards Aaron Rodgers. Will, will your book impact? Will it affect how I feel about Aaron? 
That's a, it's a great question, Judson, because I've had people, more people than not, and not many have actually read it. A lot of people have ordered it, thankfully, pre-ordered it, but uh, now they have an opportunity to read it because it's out. But the people who have read it, most of them said they like them a little more than they did before they started. But, but Michael Kay in New York, a uh, famous uh, Yankees announcer and uh, ESPN talk show host in New York City, said he, he liked them less afterward. <laughs> so uh, okay. I, I don't know. I, I always feel like my job as an author, as a biographer, is to paint a picture but to let you figure out whether you like it, don't like it, or you're somewhere in between. I don't want to make that decision for you. I hope you get a chance to, to read it and finish it. And then, yeah, I, that, I don't really feel that's my job to make that determination. I, he's, he's clearly a flawed human being. Um, and I don't yeah. agree with a lot of what he said. I tried to be as open-minded as possible to his positions. And, but uh, at the end of the day, I do think this, if he can win a championship in New York for a franchise that has not been in the Super Bowl since January of 1969, and I'm not confusing victory with virtue, but we all know in sports, when you win a championship, a lot of people confuse victory with virtue. I do think it'll wipe away a lot of these on-field and off-field perceived sins, and his, his public image will be uh, greatly improved. But where it is right now, he has not recovered from that COVID uh, statement in August of 21, those four words when he said, uh, yeah, I've been immunized and he was unvaccinated at the time. That really changed his entire life. And no, he is not uh, fully recovered from that at all. Out of the darkness, the mystery of Aaron Rodgers. Uh, continued success. Ian, the book drops today. Go and get it. Go and download it. Uh, go and read it. Thanks for your time, Ian. Much appreciated. My pleasure, Judson. Thanks for having me on.